Welcome to you all, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us once again. This is the latest edition of the Hot Topics podcast brought to you by MB Medical. Today is Friday, the 29th of November. My name is Neil Tucker and I will be running you through the next 15 minutes or so. So we're going to have a look at the latest news and research in medicine, particularly with a general practice focus. We're also going to have a look at melatonin and the role for melatonin in the management of insomnia today. Very frequent question that we've had on the Hot Topics course over the last year. And then we're going to have a look at a groundbreaking study on suspended animation in trauma victims. So let's kick off with the news and perhaps it would be remiss of me not to mention the elections in the UK. All the main political parties have put out their manifestos now suggesting that we're going to have more doctors, more nurses, more money for the NHS. There's obviously this magic money tree that always grows around election time. Perhaps my favourite suggestion was from the Conservatives, a 50 million more GP appointments every single year. Perhaps Boris and his cabinet want to come on a Hot Topics course and after a day, maybe they can muck in a little bit. In the public's mind this weekend, of course, uh, anything to do with elections is going on hold because everyone is gripped by Black Friday. We're all just going to be out grinding through the shops, desperately looking for stuff that we don't need. And I wonder if this is an opportunity for healthcare to maybe raise its popularity. In our practice, we're thinking about doing a two-for-one on amoxicillin this Friday and on Cyber Monday might treat you to being allowed to look in the notes and see what we actually write. Before I forget, the MB office have jumped on the Black Friday bandwagon. So if you are to purchase any MB course, so the Hot Topics course, Urgent Care course, Diabetes, whatever it may be, over this coming few days, you will receive our excellent cancer webinar, the full day course and the online booklet as well accompanying it absolutely free. So if you are thinking about booking a course for the new year, then now is the time. In the medical news, there's been lots of interesting stories this week. So perhaps not so relevant to us directly in primary care at the moment, but there's been a number of studies that have published over the last two weeks on immunotherapies for various types of cancer. So small cell lung cancer, head and neck cancers, prostate cancer as well. Now, none of the results are quite as positive as we've seen in recent years with immunotherapy and melanoma management. However, they have been quite promising. There are improvements compared with standard chemotherapy. They're often better tolerated with lower risk of serious adverse side effects. And for some, whilst they don't necessarily seem curative, the medication does appear to stabilise and cause disease regression, which has led to, in a small number of people, years and years of continued life. I think it's amazing that we've got these promising drugs coming through the pipeline now. The only barrier, of course, is the price, and they are so expensive. The real key in this immunotherapy era is not going to be just discovering the drugs. That in itself is impressive. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a, an amazing feat of science that we've achieved that. But then we also need to make this affordable so that there can be some equity with these treatments around the world. Now, on to the research, and I promise that we are going to come on to some actual clinical stuff in a moment. We're going to have a look at papers on heart failure and the role of glyphlazins. We're going to have a look at hypothyroidism in elderly people. We're going to have a look at the management of low back pain in primary care. But I just wanted to have a quick touch on this paper that's just published this week in the BMJ entitled Performance of UK National Health Service Compared with Other High-Income Countries, an Observational Study. This is a very interesting, uh, interesting piece of research with its stated objective to determine how the UK NHS is performing relative to health systems in other high-income countries, given that it is facing sustained financial pressure, increasing levels of demand and cuts to social care. And the results were absolutely fascinating because there's no doubt that there were some elements of very good performance balanced out by some areas of less good performance. But what is really stark is the difference in spending. So the UK spent the least per head of the country on healthcare in 2017 compared with all the other countries. And is a significant difference. So uh, we spent in dollar terms $3,825 per person in that year 
and the average for these other high income countries comes out as $5,700. So in comparison, let's say Australia, so they have a 4,800 um, average, so does Canada, France is a little bit more at 4,900, Germany 5,800, America 10,200 per head of the population. This is a staggering difference. Overall, population health in the UK was lower than the average. And I don't think this is rocket science, is it? You want to improve population health, invest in primary care, invest in public health, invest in mental health services, and things will improve. Now, on to the clinical research. And probably the biggest trial to publish in the last week was the DAPA HF study. So this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and we had some preliminary data about this already so we've talked a little bit about this on the Hot Topics course in the last couple of months but this was looking at patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and then randomizing them to either having dapagliflozin, so anti-glycemic SGLT2 inhibitor drugs or to have placebo both in addition to their usual care. And interestingly, in the trial, the patients did not have to have diabetes. So this is the first major trial looking at the independent effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on heart failure. So out of 4,700 people randomized into these two groups, they found that there was a almost 4% reduction in the worsening of heart failure, in the dapagliflozin group compared with placebo and deaths were reduced as well in the dapagliflozin group by almost 2% compared with placebo and the findings between the patients with diabetes and those who um, didn't have diabetes were actually very similar. The frequency of adverse effects didn't differ between the treatment groups as well so overall this appears to be a very very promising group. Now the next big question to answer will be do these drugs also work in people who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, so those with diastolic dysfunction? At the moment, we don't have any medications that actually improve prognosis. So if these medications could do that, then that would be a real game changer. Next, we have a paper that published in JAMA this week, and this was looking at the relationship between levothyroxine treatment and thyroid-related symptoms amongst older adults, so those 80 years or older who have subclinical hypothyroidism. Uh, essentially, in this pooled analysis of two randomized controlled trials, about 250 people or so, they found that there was no difference in any kind of thyroid related outcomes such as symptoms or quality of life score, tiredness, regardless of whether they had treatment or not. So they found that these findings do not, do not support treatment with levothyroxine for subclinical hypothyroidism in this very elderly category. And I know we've talked a little bit about this on the course as well because we've now got growing evidence that supports these findings. There had also been a lot of concern that patients who had subclinical hypothyroidism would ultimately progress on to overt hypothyroidism. But actually a, a study in 2018 shows us that the rate of progression is only around 1 in 50 older adults and that that's much more likely if you are someone with a higher TSH. So overall I think the message that we're getting from the research now is that we should be worrying less and treating less subclinical hypothyroidism in the very elderly. It's almost essentially a normal variant. And the linked editorial with the JAMA paper makes the very sensible suggestion of why don't we just change the referenced ranges of what is normal in this older group. Then we don't even need to worry about the term subclinical hypothyroidism. No one's getting stressed. No one's, uh, no patients feel like they're missing out and we don't feel like we're going to need to over-investigate over the coming years and over-treat. And finally, we have a paper published in PLOS Journal. So this was a pragmatic cluster randomized control trial on back pain interventions in a New Zealand primary care population. And they were using the free approach, so the fear reduction exercised early approach. So GP practices in the intervention group were given some special training on how to help recognize barriers to recovery and talk through those with the patients. 
and in the control group they just use usual care and what was great about this was that they demonstrated in the active intervention group that GP concordance with guideline recommendations significantly improved but the outcomes for patients didn't change at all. And this made me reflect a little bit on the Start Back trial, which we talked about years and years ago on the Hot Topics course and is now part of our NICE guidance. And I just wonder how many of us routinely use this tool. And of those who do, how many have actually got access to the highly trained physiotherapist who can deliver a psychological component for those who are very high scorers on the Start Back questionnaire? And I suspect the answer is not many of us. I just wonder how much of this is one of those disconnects between research and guidelines and the, and the real world that we're working in. Now, on to our more in-depth review. And today we're going to talk about melatonin and insomnia. And sleep has been on my mind recently, not just because I'm one of the um, significant proportion of the population who would con consider themselves a poor sleeper, but because I was recently at a friend's house, uh, a GP called Susie Armand, who works down in Wiltshire now, and she gave me a book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. So this chap is a professor originally from the UK, now works in California. And Susie's husband is a transcontinental airline pilot and he was getting really, really messed up with his sleep with all these different flights he has to do every single week. And he said this book revolutionised his life. So on that recommendation, I thought this is worth a look. It is certainly interesting. It's very thorough. It's over 300 pages long. It tells you everything you need to know about sleep, including the latest evidence base for a variety of different treatments. And I think it's what's really interesting is this is one of those areas that we just never really have any kind of formal training in, in, in medical school, in hospitals, in primary care. And yet it's such a common complaint. It's no wonder that we struggle to manage it sometimes. So our first part on the journey to understanding whether melatonin might be helpful for insomnia is understanding how it works and what it does in the body. So what melatonin does not do is it does not make you sleep. What melatonin does is it tells the brain that it is time when you might think about sleeping and the brain has to sort it out. And Matthew Walker uses this great analogy in his book of the 100 metre race. So melatonin would be the timing official that pulls the trigger on the starting pistol. But actually, it's not participating in the race at all. The, the race is run by various different regions of the brain that have to then actively generate sleep, all fighting it out amongst themselves. And so this explains why melatonin is effective in some groups. So, for example, children with neurodevelopmental disorders, also people on the autistic spectrum, often have blunted rises in their melatonin affecting their circadian rhythm, and then melatonin supplementation can be helpful. However, in our patients with straight-up insomnia appropriate endogenous production of melatonin is not normally the issue and there's a huge range of other factors which might be involved so it could be that people are um, are, are very anxious and this is a typical pattern people get less sleep they become anxious about sleep and then they sleep less as a result i uh, i had that pattern for many many years until i realized that i just needed to not worry about it so much it didn't matter if i didn't get that much sleep it could be the foods we eat and the things that we drink so most people will have some caffeine intake within their day, but many will be unaware of the prolonged duration of action that caffeine exerts in the body. So typically we think about it being sort of four hours or so. If you think about it in terms of half-lives, the more caffeine you have, even earlier in the day, will take longer to eliminate and actually it can still be having substantial effect in the evening. And that's before we even look at people who are particularly sensitive to caffeine. Alcohol as well, we know is highly corrosive to people's sleep patterns. And so too with sleeping tablets. So in the book, he talked about sleep physiology studies that clearly show the type of sleep that you get from sleeping tablets is not the same as natural sleep. So you lose out on the deep brainwave sleep, non-REM sleep, and that's going to have a number of negative effects on people. You're not going to have a good memory. You're not going to feel as well rested. And um, in the book, they talk about all the other negative implications, such as the effect on immunity, weight, and even aging. So sedative medication really aren't a helpful alternative. 
So what about melatonin? After all, you can buy it in many countries around the world simply over the counter as a health food supplement. And of course, there are licensed versions in the UK. The British Association of Psychopharmacology in their latest guidance on the treatment of insomnia do talk about melatonin as a therapeutic option. But the reality is this is based on a very small handful of small randomised controlled trials. These are all been focused on the elderly. There is a rationale for that. There is a natural decline of melatonin with age. And the studies demonstrate a modest improvement in the duration it takes for someone to get to sleep. But the benefits are pretty small. It may seem reasonable to assume that the reason there's no data on younger people is because these studies either haven't been done or they've been done and they've been found ineffective and they're not published. Matthew Walker doesn't recommend melatonin as a sleep product and of course he doesn't recommend um, sleeping tablets either. So what does he recommend? And the reality is it's not rocket science so stick to a sleep schedule have good sleep hygiene, avoid caffeine, particularly in the afternoon, avoid alcohol, particularly in the afternoon, even encourage us, if you want booze, it's better to drink it in the morning. Um, Possibly not if you're going to work, we have to think about the GMC, don't take afternoon naps and relax before bedtime. All very simple interventions that people can employ and that in combination with digital CBTI, for instance, could be very, very effective for a lot of people. The book is well worth a read. But if 300 pages is too long for you, and I have to say it almost broke me, then you can get the highlights by just watching his TED talk. So if you just Google TED Matthew Walker, then you'll see him explaining why sleep is your superpower. And finally, we're going to have a look at what's groundbreaking in the world of medicine this week. And the story that caught my eye was about humans being placed in suspended animation for the first time. So this is not talking about cryogenically freezing uh, people when they die or before they die. I'll be honest, if you've cryogenically frozen yourself, I'm afraid you are absolutely stuffed. There is no way you're going to be um, thawed out successfully. This is more like an extension to the techniques that have been used in heart surgery in recent years where they've cooled down the body slightly to try and prolong the safe duration for surgery. But this is taking it to a much more extreme level. So this was an American team and they were recruiting I say recruiting because the participants could not consent to this because they were effectively dead due to major acute trauma. So they were brought into an emergency department in cardiac arrest and then they were rapidly called to around 10 to 15 degrees by replacing their blood with saline, ice cold saline. The effect of this is that it dramatically Uh, reduces brain activity and helps prevent the degradation that you see in particularly the brain but also in other more peripheral tissues when people have died and fail uh, and their circulation fails them. So they believe that using this method gives them about two hours or so to perform life-saving surgery rather than just minutes which of course um, would mean that most people Uh, most people would inevitably die. The initial research has been done on pigs and that has shown that at least pigs can be successfully cooled for three hours and then resuscitated afterwards. This trial is in its infancy. They're trying to recruit just 20 patients and there's still a lot of questions about the reperfusion injuries that those patients may induce. We just don't know, for example, what's going to be their cognitive outcome, but it does provide a glimmer of hope in these severe acute trauma patients who had no other options. So that's it for another couple of weeks of Hot Topics Roundup. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Feel free to ask any questions or share any ideas via our Twitter page. So at GP Hot Topics or at Dr. Neil Tucker. You can also find us on the mbmedical.com website. Please do subscribe and I can make a really strong case to the office why I should keep doing this. And we will join you again on the 13th of December when we will have a new government. See you then. Bye bye.